Hello everyone and welcome. In this video, I'm gonna answer a question I get asked all the time as a commercial pilot, mostly from my passengers. And that is, how do you land an airplane when the weather turns bad? When there's almost no visibility due to clouds, rain, snow, or fog, how do pilots even find the runway? So in the next little bit, I'm gonna explain in as simple way possible how we land in bad weather. And it's actually really fascinating. So even if you're not a pilot or not a pilot yet, or maybe you have a fear of flying, next time you get on a flight and the weather doesn't look so great, you'll know what we're doing as pilots in the front and understand what's going on. Let's do it. All right, so you probably already know that commercial pilots are trained to fly day, night, and through all sorts of different weather conditions. And in the 15 years that I've been flying as a commercial pilot up in Canada, I've seen my fair share of bad weather days as well. If the visibility is really poor and the clouds are really low to the ground, it makes it a challenge to try to find the runway. Today's aircraft are equipped with modern avionics and with a properly trained flight crew, landing in low visibility because of cloud or fog or rain or snow, it's just a normal part of being a commercial pilot. So how do we do it? Let me show you. All right, so in this example, we have our runway on the right side that we're trying to land on. And of course, it's surrounded by obstacles such as buildings, trees, maybe a cow, maybe some mountains that get in the way of us landing. Now in the daytime, when it's nice and clear, you can see those obstacles, like in this video where I'm about to land. However, if there's clouds in the way, all of a sudden not only is the runway obscured, but also all of those obstacles. And it is our job, our number one job as pilots, is to make sure we don't crash into anything. So how do we do that when we can't see the runway or those obstacles? We fly what's called an IFR approach, or an instrument approach. And they are represented on these charts, almost like a map for individual runways at airports all over the world. And we use these charts in the cockpit to guide us to the appropriate runway that we're trying to land on. They provide critical information with regards to how and when to descend, as well as where to steer the airplane so that we are lined up with the runway. Now, I'm gonna walk you step-by-step step through the process, and we're gonna use this approach chart as an example. The destination is Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, and there's the airport on the map. So the first thing we need to do as pilots is what we call programming or briefing the approach. And this involves inputting all the approach information into our avionics to get ready to actually fly it. It is critical that we get this right, because remember, we're in the clouds. This is what's guiding us to the runway and also keeping us clear of any obstacles. Now, if we take a look at this approach chart, it provides a lot of information. So let's break it down so it's simpler to understand. The first part at the top gives us some important information with regards to what air traffic control frequencies we're gonna need, what navigational equipment frequencies we need to input. And on this chart in particular, it even tells us what minimum altitude we can descend to within 100 nautical miles of the airport. Now, the next part of the chart is the map section, and it's basically an overlay of where we're gonna be flying. Pilots use this to help plan their descent as well as navigate to the final approach for the appropriate runway. Every approach has a starting point called the initial approach fix, and that's where the approach begins. It also tells us what altitudes we can safely descend to when we're 25 nautical miles from the airport, or in this case, from that beacon, depending on which direction we're coming from. Assuming we're flying in from the northeast, 5,000 feet will keep us clear of all obstacles. Now, we start the approach by flying to this first waypoint called MDM. How they come up with the names, I have no idea, but that is what it is called. And then we turn to the right and we follow this track. It's called an arc. And as we're flying along, it says we can descend to 5,000 feet as long as we're on the arc. Now, we're gonna fly this until we reach Gadeg. That's another name of another waypoint. And this is where we are gonna turn final towards the airport, and this is called your final approach. So once we do that, we're gonna take a look at the next part of the approach, and this is what's gonna guide us to the runway. It's called an ILS, or an instrument landing system, and it's gonna give us a glide slope that we can follow all the way to the runway. Not only that, but it will also provide lateral information to make sure we're lined up with the runway center line. Remember those navigational radio frequencies we first talked about? If we tune in the radio frequency 109.5 into our navigation radio, it will display the ILS for that runway on our avionics. And all of this is literally displayed right in front of us as we're flying the approach. 
This shows us if we are left or right of the runway center line, and this shows us our glide path if we are high or low. Here's a simple example. If we're descending on the glide slope correctly, everything should be lined up. If we descend below the glide slope, it'll tell us to climb. If we climb above the glide slope, it'll tell us to descend. We want to make sure our glide slope is right in the center, all the way to the runway. The same applies to our lateral navigation. If we go far to the right, it'll tell us to go back to the center. If we go to the left, it'll tell us to go to the right. We want to keep this centered as well, because that's going to line us up with the runway. As long as we keep both of these indications centered, then we'll have a nice, stable approach all the way down to the runway. Here's another example of an ILS approach I flew quite recently. As you can see, I was slightly above the glide slope, but made a small correction to get back on the glide path. Some approaches use step-down altitudes, much like a staircase where you have minimum altitudes at different distances all the way along the approach. Now, as a pilot, it is crucial that you do not descend below any minimum altitudes because, as you can see, there is terrain on a lot of these approaches that could be obscured by cloud. And that's why it's so important for pilots to make sure that they've briefed the approaches thoroughly and that all of the avionics are set up correctly. All right, so we're in the airplane descending towards the runway, getting closer and closer to the ground. At some point, if we do not see the runway, we're gonna to have to overshoot. And this is where the next part of the approach comes in. It's called approach minimums. Now there are several different kinds of approach minimums depending on which approach you fly. But in this example, if we're flying the glide slope on the ILS, we're allowed to descend to 3,249 feet above sea level, which translates to 200 feet above the ground. If we see the runway at this point, we're allowed to continue and land the airplane. This is why a stabilized approach is so important because you may break out of the clouds at only a few hundred feet before touchdown. If you don't see the runway by the time you reach approach minimums, then you have to do an overshoot. And pilots train for this on a regular basis to make sure that they're ready in the event that this actually does happen. Now, missed approach procedure is written on the approach chart as well as drawn on the approach chart map so that there's no confusion. So what does this mean? Well, we're gonna have to fly to a different airport where the weather is more suitable for a safe landing. And pilots plan for this on every single flight. It's called an alternate airport. Now, in some cases, it may be necessary to overshoot and wait for the weather to get better. Try the approach again, and hopefully the weather has improved slightly that you can make a safe landing at the original airport. Of course, this depends on how much fuel the airplane has, because no matter what, every flight has to carry enough fuel to land at an alternate airport just in case. And these rules apply to all aircraft, big, medium, and small. So next time you're on a flight flying somewhere and the weather looks a little bit grim, you're up to speed on what exactly those pilots up front are doing and how they're planning to land safely, no matter what the weather conditions. You can see the rain just dumping down there to the left. If you don't mind, check out some of my other videos. And if you want to see an actual IFR approach, check out some of the videos on my channel as I'm doing them on a regular basis as part of my flying job. Actually, I take that back. This isn't a flying job. This is a dream come true to get to fly through the clouds like this. And uh, actually, I'll keep this video going for the next few minutes because what you're watching now is me flying a real life IFR approach. We're on an ILS. Remember, that's the instrument landing system, an ILS approach. And we're going to break out of the clouds here in a few minutes. So you'll see what a low visibility IFR approach really looks like. And just for reference, the clouds are really low right now. They're down to about 200 feet above the ground, and the visibility is only about half a mile. So as you can see, we're following the ILS down to the runway. Got a nice, stable approach. Just following that glide slope all the way down to our minimum altitude. If we do not see the runway at that point, we have to overshoot and go around. So we're approaching our minimum altitude right now. So I'm looking outside to see if I can see the runway or the runway lights. And there they are, the runway lights are straight ahead. They're really faint because of the poor visibility, but we're gonna follow those to the runway. And we can descend below our minimum altitude and land the airplane. Landing gears down, all of our checklists are complete. 
I'm going to try to make this a silky smooth landing for the passengers in the back. Well, there you have it, everyone. A silky smooth landing just as promised. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video, especially for those of you who aren't pilots or aren't pilots yet. Hopefully this video was very insightful and uh, hopefully everybody learned something new. I know as a pilot myself, I'm learning new things every time I get in an airplane. And speaking of that, if you're curious about becoming a pilot, I've also made a couple videos uh, that explain how to get your pilot's license from start to finish, as well as what the costs are to do so. Don't forget to like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and uh, don't forget to subscribe, everyone. I really appreciate the support. We'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye.